Our first lesson comes to us from Numbers chapter 6, verses 22 to 27. This will also serve as today's sermon text. The Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron and his sons, This is how you are to bless the Israelites. Say to them, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. So they will put my name on the Israelites, and I will bless them. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Grace, mercy, and peace from our trying God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. The lesson from our old, the lesson from Numbers, as we looked at, they were. As you're reading them and hearing them, you're probably thinking these are probably one of the more familiar verses, words, in all of the Bible. And that is because we hear them all the time, don't we? At the end of most services, if not all services, we hear these words in some way. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you peace. Today being Trinity Sunday, we can't help but see the threefold repetition which reminds us of the three persons of the Trinity, even though the Bible never uses that word, nor even directly tells us, look, all three persons are blessing you. We can certainly see it as we look at the whole of Scripture and see how God works as, as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We can certainly see how the Father is the one who blesses us and keeps us. He's the one who created us, made us, he holds us, he preserves us, he takes care of us, he provides for us. When we think about being gracious towards us, we think definitely of the Son, Jesus Christ. How gracious he was in saving us from our sins, dying on a cross so that we could be saved. And then that favor and that peace that only the Holy Spirit can give us by bringing us to faith to know that we are saved so that we can live in this life full of confidence that no matter what happens to us, everything is going to be okay. We can certainly see this blessing. And because this blessing is really from God, these are God's words that a pastor, or even at that time, the priests were saying to the people, these are God's words, and therefore this is not a wish. This isn't some hope. I'm not saying, well, I hope everything goes well for you. No, these are what God has to say to you, and therefore, these aren't just mere words or a mere pious wish. This is an absolute real blessing. When God first told the people this blessing, they were in the desert of Sinai. They were at Mount Sinai, and they were going, and they were preparing themselves to leave the mountain so that they could go take the promised land, the land that God promised to Abraham long ago, that this is where your descendants will live, and from there, there will come a Savior to save the whole world and therefore be a blessing to everyone. And this, they were about to go now, and they were going to take it. And before they leave, God said, he tells Moses, Now tell your brother Aaron and tell the other priests, this is what I want you to do. I want you to bless the people and I want you to continuously do this. But why would the people need to hear God's blessing? Well, what they were about to do was going to be really hard. I mean, if you look at the history of the world, especially at that time, and you look at the size of the nations, Israel is really tiny. Sure, we call them a great nation, but compared to all the other nations, they're not so great. There's a lot of people, just as God promised, but not as many as the people they're going to have to face. They weren't anywhere near the number of people that they just escaped from, the Egyptians. And they weren't going to be anywhere near the nations that they were about to try to conquer. And as they would soon find out that these people, people or weren't only just more in number, but they were bigger than them too. In fact, they even called them giants. And these giants had walled cities, super thick walls that would have been almost impossible for these Israelites to penetrate, to be able to take over. They would have quickly found out we're no match for these guys. 
And it's in that moment they were definitely going to need to be reminded. The Lord is blessing you and keeping you. His face is shining upon you and being gracious to you. And his favor is towards you. And he's giving you peace. They needed to know that they were going to be okay. That this was actually going to work out. Because when God speaks, it happens. When God said, let there be light, there was light. When he said, let there be anything else, there it was. When God speaks, things happen. His words pack power. It's so much more different than our words, isn't it? I mean, how often when we speak, our words don't really possess the same kind of meaning, much less the power that God's word has. How often when you run into someone at the store or on the street or just in passing, and you ask them this typical greeting, how are you? Well, we just say that, don't we? We really have meaning behind it. Or we're hoping they're okay, they look okay, because we're seeing them at that moment. But when we say it, we're not expecting much of a reply. Maybe great, and then you pass, and that's it. You're not really positioning yourself to say, all right, I'm going to ask them how they're doing, and I want them, and I'm going to, we're going to have a talk. We're going to have an hour-long conversation in the store right now, so I want to know how they're doing and what's all going on with them. It's just not what we're expecting. It's not what usually happens, and therefore, those words really don't have the meaning that they could mean Say, like, if you go visit a dear friend or a family member and you sit down in their house and you say, how are you doing? You're really looking for an answer and you're willing to sit there and talk about it. How often when we make a promise, does our promise sometimes end up being meaningless? We might intend it to work out. We might intend it to be great. We might intend to be there in that moment of need. But then something comes up, something way that you couldn't even plan for. God is away, and you weren't able to keep that promise. While you intended to have meaning in those words, for that person in that moment, that promise became meaningless. But it's not so with God. When God speaks, things happen. When he makes a promise, he keeps it. When he makes a promise to forgive all of your sins, he, can't, he keeps it. When he made a promise to send his son to die on the cross so that our sins could be forgiven, he kept it. When he makes a promise that he's not going to destroy this world until judgment day, he, he's, he keeps it. Now look at the promise that he's giving to you in this blessing. He promises to keep you. He promises to hold on to you, to, hold, to grab you, to hold you in his arms. So that you will always have his blessings. He promises that he's going to turn his face towards you. He's always going to show you a wonderful smile. And he's going to love you and care for you. And he's always promising that he's going to give you his favor. Which means he's going to work all things for your good. Another promise of God. That's not some wish. That's not only here either. As you leave. These doors, as you go about your life today, tomorrow, and, for, and into the future, God's blessing you. And he's always there. He's working all things for your good. What makes this incredible, much less makes it so incredible, not only will this happen for us because God promised, is that he would even do it. That he would even give us promises like this. I mean, look at the people of Israel, the people whom he first gave this promise to. Up until this moment, the, the moment even before they went into the promised land, they weren't a people that you would think God should be blessing. Because they hadn't really been treating God too well. The record of Israel's sins is well documented in the Old Testament. God saves them from the Egyptians. He parts the Red Sea. He gives ten plagues. He rescues them from an awful Slavery, and it doesn't take long before they start going, you know what? I'd rather go back to back to Egypt. God's not doing enough for me. They're already complaining. God gave them miracle bread, bread in heaven. Imagine waking up every morning and having all and having the food that you need, sitting on your lawn or on your doorstep with the morning dew. You go pick up what you need, everything else will evaporate, and then tomorrow, there it will be again. 
That's what God did with bread. He had bread waiting for them every morning so that they could have their need fulfilled every day. And when they needed meat, he brought in quail from who knows where. He, he blew them in with a strong wind so that they could have meat to eat. And when they were thirsty because they were in a desert, he either changed really bad water into pure water, or he did even a more remarkable thing. He poured water from a rock. And yet, despite all of these miracles, the way he was taking care of them, they still complained as if God wasn't doing enough. And then God gives them his commands. He even organizes them. He gets them straight. He says, this is how life is going to be for you in the new land. So they didn't have to worry about how to make laws, how to organize themselves, even what to do. They didn't need to ask, what does God want? God told them everything they needed to know. And after doing all these great things for them, you would think they would want to listen to him. But days after he tells them, hey, the number one thing I want you to do is not worship anyone else. They make a golden calf and worship it. <clears throat> and yet God, after all of that, still wants to bless them. Now, our sins are not as well documented as the Israelites, but if we're honest, we're just as guilty as they are. We also complain that God doesn't take care of us as much as he really does. We often look to him and question at his every move. And when it comes to his commands, well, we break them all. We're lawbreakers. We haven't worshipped God like we should. We haven't put him first in our lives. We take his name in vain or we don't even go to him. We give him a bad name by how we act. We don't worship him like we should. We don't take care of his word. We don't study his word like we should. We don't listen to authority like God commands us to. And we don't protect life like we should, or we lust, or we steal, or we don't defend someone's good name. And a lot of times we want what we can't have to the point that we even are considering sinning to get it. We break all of the rules, just like Israel did. And still, this blessing is yours. God wants to bless you. In fact, he absolutely does bless you because he doesn't break his promises because his words have meaning and his words are for you. He really is holding you in his arms. He's really taking care of you. He is really ruling all things for your good. It may not make sense in any way, but you know what? We have a God who doesn't make sense. Today is Trinity Sunday, and try to figure that one out. Three persons and one God, it just doesn't add up. It doesn't fit into our brain. You know what? We can find a lot of comfort in that, in knowing that our God is bigger and, and so we can't even think about how, we can't even begin to concentrate or even consider everything that God is. He's just that much better. Well, don't we want a God who's bigger and smarter than us? Who's stronger than us? Because if these are equal, we can fit them into our head. Well then, how is he going to save us? How is he going to defeat our enemies? How is he going to rule all things for our good? Oh, he's bigger and it's best for us. That's the way we know he can keep that promise to always hold on to us. And he's always smiling at us. This Probably this phrase probably has way more meaning, had more, way more meaning to the people in Moses' day than it does to us, just simply of the political circumstances of this time. We get glimpses of this in the Bible, but we really get a clear picture of it in the book of Esther. If you haven't read it in a while, Esther needed to save her people from, from an evil plot that was sent to go and annihilate all the Jews. And, but the only way to do it, she had to go to her husband, the king. Well, here's the thing. You don't visit the king, and it doesn't matter if you're married to him, unless he invites you. That's just the way it worked. That's the way it was back then, and it's the way it was for a long time. You had that much awe and respect for your majesty that you didn't even approach him unless he called for you. And if you approached him without an invitation, one of two things could happen. One, he could smile at you and welcome you in, and then therefore he would listen to you. Or he could turn his face away from you, which didn't mean he wasn't going to listen. It meant that, but it was worse. 
It meant that you were going to die now because you broke the law and you were executed for even approaching the king. You were taking your life into your own hands if you approached the king's throne room without an invitation. Well, here we are standing before the Almighty God. We're standing in his throne room. How is he going to receive you? He smiles at you. He looks at you. And he says, welcome. Which means you're not going to die. Which means you're going to live forever. Sure, you'll, live, you'll leave this world. But you will live forever in heaven with him by your side. He's not going to condemn you or punish you as you deserve. No, he's forgiven you. And he's going to take care of you. His favor is upon us. And therefore, we truly have peace. If you know the ending of a conflict, the stress kind of goes away, doesn't it? If you're a sports fan, I don't know if you are or not, but if you are, watching a game as it unfolds can be quite exhilarating. It can be very stressful at times, especially if it's your team that's playing or someone you know is playing. You want a good outcome. And so you're with the team on the ups and downs of the whole match, and you're just wondering, you're hoping, and you're going, come on, you can do this. Well, say like you already know the ending because it's a, you're watching a replay and you already know how it's all going to go. And you watch, and as you're watching it, you see those ups and downs and you see some of the blunders that might have happened throughout the match. You're not going to worry when you see that. You're going to actually be very calm because you're like, what they win in the end. It's just, it's cool how they overcame this, but it's over, it's over, it's already taken care of. Well, in life, we already know how this is all going to work out. We're going to be in heaven. So we'll go through the ups and downs, and we may not see them coming. We may not know how it all played out. We may not know all that God has in store for us. And so there will be difficulties, there will be goodness, and there will be times where nothing's going on. But we don't have to lose our minds or be super hurt when bad things happen because we know how this will end. We're going to be in heaven. And knowing how it all ends gives us peace and confidence so that even when life isn't so peaceful, we can still rejoice and praise our God every single day. This is what your God has given to you. This is the blessing that you hear at, at the end of most Sundays. And this blessing is real and it is yours. Hold on to that blessing. Cherish it. Don't let it go in one ear and out the other. Listen to the words. Hold on to the words so that as you go and live your life, you can hold on to that peace and comfort that only God can give you. Amen. Please rise.